Alright, hello, hello. Today I'll be doing the code bi-weekly contest 33. Um, I'll be explaining the solutions to hopefully all four problems. Uh, if it's super hard, maybe only three, but let's see how it goes. Okay, this was a kind of kind of bad contest for me because even though I solved all four problems, I didn't do well. So I guess this was an easier contest, or it was supposed to be an easier contest, but I still managed to screw up on it by being really slow on problem four. And problem four was just a classic DFS problem, and maybe I um, I underestimated it. So um, I can explain all four problems. So why don't we just get started? Problem one: thousand separator. Given an integer n and a dot dot as the thousand separator, return it in string format. So uh, first thing we do is just we, we convert it into a string, and then we construct a new string from right to left because the thousand separators start from the right. Unit digits are on the right, of course. So we just put a dot, and we do that by checking if the number of digits we've seen so far is a multiple of three. Um, but also, if we have a number like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, we don't want to put a dot at the beginning. Um, normally it would because the number um, has an has a multiple of three number of digits, but we don't want to add a dot at the beginning, so we just make sure that whenever we add a dot, it's not at the very beginning of the number. Uh, and that's how we construct the string, um, and then at the end we just return it. So, yeah. Problem two, minimum number of vertices to reach all nodes. Given a directed acyclic graph with n vertices numbered from 0 to n minus 1, and an array edges where edges i equals from i to i represents a directed edge from node um, from to node 2, find the small set of vertices from which all nodes in the graph are reachable. It's guaranteed that a unique solution exists. Notice that you can return the vertices in any order. Okay, so my claim is that every node that doesn't have any parents is going to be in the answer, and the answer is only going to consist of these nodes. So we'll start from the easy one, which is that um, any node which doesn't have any parents is going to be in the answer. So this is really easy to prove if you just have any node and then it doesn't have any parents but it leads to a bunch more nodes. So by definition you're not going to be able to reach this node from any other node. So you're going to have to include this node in the answer. Otherwise you're not going to be able to reach this node. And the answer requires um, you to be able to reach every node from this node. So every node that doesn't have, an appar have a parent is going to be in this answer. And how are we going to prove that these are going to be the only nodes in the answer. Well, if you look at if you look at this diagram, for example, um, if you have a node that does have a parent, so for example, we have this node, um, and there might be there might be more nodes coming into this one. It doesn't really matter. But if you look at this node, it does have a parent, and this is not going to be in the answer because instead we could just include this node, and this node will cover two nodes. It will cover itself and this node. Yeah. It's going to cover two nodes. So it's always better to take the parent because the parent covers the parent itself and our initial node. So it's always going to be beneficial to take the parent of a node if it exists. But if it doesn't exist, it's just going to be a parent root node. So we proved that our only answers are going to be nodes that don't have parents and that all nodes that don't have a parent are going to be in our answer. So we proved both directions and this means that these are just going to be the answer. So in order to find all nodes that don't have a parent, we just look at the adjacency list. And then if the adjacency list is um, is empty, if it doesn't have any parents, then we know it's going to be part of the answer. And then we just return it. So yeah, this problem requires a bit of thinking beforehand, I guess. Uh, but once you've thought of that, it's pretty easy to implement. Problem three, minimum number of function calls to make target array. Your task is to form an integer array nums from an initial array of zeros r that is the same size as nums. Return the minimum number of function calls to make nums from r. The answer is guaranteed to fit in inside a 32-bit sign integer. Okay, so this function, we're going to be able to make any number of moves on it, but we want to minimize the number of moves we make. Every move, we can either increase a specific index by 1, or we can uh, multiply all elements by 2. Uh, and what we're going to do is essentially we're going to simulate this backwards and take a greedy algorithm. Here's what I mean. So if we have an array such as uh, 3, 5, our best bet is going, to, is going to be to make 
um, all elements in this array even first. So make them into 2, 4. And this is going to take two moves. Uh, and then divide everything by two. And we want to make all of them even first because otherwise we can't we can't step backwards because we're doing this simulation backwards. So we have to make sure all elements in the array are even before we can make the second type of move. And in order to make them all even, we're going to have to reduce all the odd numbers by one. Once we make it even, um, this is going to save us a lot of moves because multiplying all elements by two, it's going to be faster than increasing all elements by their own amount. So if we make it into 1, 2, dividing by 2 is only going to take one move. But if we're going to do it by increasing by 1s, this is going to take three moves. And that's going to be a lot worse. If the numbers get bigger, um, it's going to get like linearly worse. So it's always better to divide by 2 when you're able to. Um, yeah, and then essentially, once we get to all 1s or all the elements, or some of the elements are 1s, and the rest are zeros, then we can just reduce all of those to zeros, and then we're done. Um, okay, so here's how we actually do that. So while all the numbers are not zeros, we take all the odd numbers. So if we have an array like this, we're going to reduce all of the odd numbers by 1. So this becomes 0, this becomes 2, this becomes 4, and this becomes 6. And then we can just keep the even ones the same. And this is going to take 4, because that's the number of odd numbers in here. Um, dividing by 2 is only going to take one step. So we divide all of them by 2. And then we repeat. All the, under, all the odd numbers are going to get reduced by 1. And there's going to be a plus 4. And then all the even numbers oop, stay the same. And then dividing by 2 takes one step. Uh, and then we just do the same thing. Uh, and then the rest becomes zeros. So there's going to be a plus 4 again. Yeah, that's basically how we do it. We just add 1 for every odd number in the array. And then dividing by 2 is going to take one step. Yeah, so it's just a simple algorithm. I guess you have to take a bit of intuition uh, and you have to convince yourself that it works because I couldn't prove it to myself that it works, but you know, I just I just believe that it works and it did. Yeah, and here's my code. This is the part where you're adding one for every odd number. This is the part where you're dividing by two and then adding one um, for the division by two. Yeah, so we're just working backwards in this problem and a bit of greedy and intuition. Problem four, detect cycles in 2D grid. Given a 2D array of characters grid of size n by n, you need to find if there exists any cycle consisting of the same value in grid. A cycle is a path of length four or more in the grid that starts and ends at the same cell. From a given cell, you can move to one of the cells adjacent to it in one of the four directions if it has the same value of the current cell. Also, you cannot move to the cell that you visited in your previous move. Return true if any cycle of the same value exists in grid, otherwise return false. Okay, so this problem, trip me up at the beginning because input size is going to be 500 by 500 and that's 250,000 and I had an n squared algorithm where n is the number of n is the number of squares in the grid and that would be way too slow so instead we're going to have to have like a smarter algorithm that requires a bit of thinking so here's what we're going to do we're going to do a DFS and this DFS is going to be on all elements in the grid also I'm just going to draw lines for for DFSs because that's easier than drawing the actual grids. So we start it here, and then we do a DFS, okay? If at any point we come across a, a square that we visited before, so for example, if, if this branch comes here and visits a cell that we visited before, then we know this is a cycle. This is a cycle, and we can return true, because we're only going to check if there, if there is a cycle. We don't want to know where it is, or how long it is, or like minimize anything. We're just, gonna, we're just trying to find whether there exists a cycle. So if at any point the path touches back on itself, then we know it works, and we can just return true. Otherwise, if there's no cycle, then we move on to the next unvisited cell. And that's going to be over here. We know that when we're doing this DFS, we're not going to come upon any of, the, any of the points, any of the squares that we've seen in our previous DFS. So we're not going to have anything like this. Here, I guess I should use a different color. We're not going to have anything that looks like this. Because if it touches the previous one, then this this red path would be part of the black path because it would have been encountered before in the DFS. So we know that this is not possible. So we know that this DFS is only going to touch new points. And then if at any point it touches a point that we've seen previously on the red path, so for example, if we, we touch here, then we know that this is a path. And then we can return true. But otherwise, we just move on to the next one, uh, the next unvisited point, and this does a DFS. And then we just keep going. We just keep going to the next unvisited point and then finding if a cycle exists by looking at if we visited a point that we visited before. 
But also we have to make sure that when we're doing DFS, we don't encounter the same point twice, or I mean, we don't go back to our previous point. So for example, if we have a grid here um, and we're going here, we can't move back to the previous square. So that's just the check that we do over here. Um, over here, we just make sure that it doesn't go back to the previous square. Um, yeah, this is the code, I guess. Uh, this is the DFS function. This is the recursion part. This is the checking all four um, directions. And at the at the very bottom, or I guess our final step is just to see, is just to call the DFS function on the first unvisited node. And this part is making sure that we go to an actually unvisited node. We don't want to go back to a visited node because that's going to give us some false positives. That's going to tell us that, for example, um, over here. So if we go to a node that we visited before, for example, if we go if we go here when we're not supposed to, then we're going to get a false positive when we move here because that's going to tell us that we've gone to a place we visited before, but we actually haven't in the same DFS. So we're just going to make sure that we don't um, DFS on any points that we visited before because that's redundant and also wrong. Um, but otherwise, if it's unvisited, then we call the DFS. See if there's a cycle. If there is a cycle, then we return true. If at no point we find a cycle, then we return false. So yeah, that's problem four. Okay, so this, pro uh, this contest contest was the worst contest for me. Uh, easy problems, but I took way too long on problem four because I got to CLE. Um, yeah, it was like the first time I solved all four problems but got a kind of worse rank, I think. Because normally when I don't do so well, it's because I don't solve the fourth problem. That, but this time the contest was, I guess, relatively easy and I just didn't do too well on it. So yeah, I hope you learned something from this video and I don't think I'll be doing the weekly contest today, so you can only expect one video from me this week, but I hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for watching. Goodbye.